I'd like to thank Mazda Underwoods in Colchester for lending me this Mazda 2 Hybrid. Yeah, it's a Toyota Yaris, isn't it? But that's not a bad thing. Mazda want to bring down the average CO2 of the cars they sell. And instead of trying to beat Toyota at their own game, they've taken one of the best small hybrids on the market and stuck their own badge on it. There are some differences though. Different colors, different wheels, different trims, different dealers. If you trust a dealer, for example, I've bought a car from Mazda Underwoods in Colchester, so I know I trust them. If you trust a dealer, that does make a difference. Also different finance packages, and that can make a difference as well. So before you decide which one's for you, I recommend you check out both. It's priced from between 21,000 and 24,500 pounds. It's available in three trim levels, the pure, the agile, which is this one, the middle level, and the top one, the select. And it's not to be confused with the existing Mazda 2 petrol, which is a mild hybrid. They're gonna to continue to sell that alongside this full hybrid model. Under the bonnet is a 1.5 litre three cylinder petrol engine with 116 PS of power and 120 newton meters of torque. It has a 14 to one compression ratio, which is extremely high, and it runs the Atkinson cycle. Both those things make this engine incredibly efficient. The trouble with the Atkinson cycle is it doesn't produce much power, which is why there's a 140 newton meter motor there to boost it along, and a battery pack under the rear seats. Now for the driving position. I'm five foot 10. I'm longer in the body than I am in the leg. So I do often have to be a bit closer to the pedals than most people of my height. I'm gonna go all the way back now and I can press the pedals about halfway. All the way forwards and, well yeah, that's very forwards and I would only need very little legs to reach those pedals now. Let's go back to where I think is right, about there. Click that into place, up. See how up it goes. Get pumping, quite high. Oh, my head's getting close to the ceiling now. That's really high. Still going, oh, there we go. And my hair is touching the ceiling. Let's go down, quick as I can. This is about where I'd want to be. This feels about right. And it goes only a little bit lower than that. So I'm nearish the bottom, but as I say, I do have quite a long body. And then we got the Steering wheel, that, that's all the way out, and that's comfortable for me, so I need it all the way out. Goes in and out, about an average amount, and up and down, about an average amount as well. Head restraint, well, they're quite long, so easy to get them in the correct place. And, oh, yeah, they, they certainly go up high enough for anyone who's tall, and if you're not so tall, they go right the way down to the bottom of the seat, so there's no gap in between. The seat belt isn't adjustable, but the, the seat is, so you can change the height of the seat to suit your seat belt. Now for the rear seats, the rear door opens not that wide actually, I would say that's about 60 degrees, but the opening's all right, I can get in there. Yep, no problem at all. It's quite comfortable back here. The seats are squishy and you sit high up. That's because the battery is under these seats. The good thing about sitting high up is I can see over the people in front of me. That reduces car sickness, but also the length of my leg goes down instead of forward. So I don't need as much distance between me and the seat in front to get comfortable. So it is a good use of space. This seat is set in my driving position, by the way. I have a fist of knee room and I have about three fingers of headroom. The boot is 286 litres with the seats up and 935 litres with the seats down. I've not taken these seats down before, but let's see how easy it is. That's the parcel shelf out of the way. And quite simple, a little catch on the right and the left, and they go down. And there we are, 935 litres. Here's a detailed view of the interior. I'm gonna start you off with the door. So there's a door bin here, that is hard plastic, and there is a space here for a bottle. That's half a litre, but I think that could take a litre. Moving round, got some fabric here. That's very hard. It's well placed to rest your elbow, but it, there is no padding in there. That's smooth, nice little silver touch here. Door handle there, quite hard to get your hand in there. So I tend to just put my thumb here and my hand like that and squeeze and that's the easiest way to open the door. Here's the electric windows, 
electric mirrors, and that is to lock the windows and lock and unlock the door. Fabric all around here, that's hard and hard plastic here with a nice chrome strip along there. The air vent is not adjustable in terms of how intense it's blowing, but you can move it side to side, up and down. You can turn it off by moving it all the way to the right and then it clicks off. Here we have hard plastic moving down. A few fake buttons here. That's the boot release. There is the all important fuel release. It took me a while to find that. You got automatic high beam here and this is the manual adjustment for how high your headlights are. This plastic here, that is soft, that's hard. Air vent for your window there. Air vent for your window in the front there and what looks like could be a speaker, that round opening there within those tiny little holes. Let's go to the steering wheel now. So the steering wheel is leather, feels nice. There's no sort of sharp bits around here that can catch your finger. This is plastic and smooth. Cruise control here and then here the controls, the screen and your music. Something that took me a while was to find how to skip the track because it's underneath the cruise control. And I was looking here for ages how to skip the track to the music I was listening to. I was messing with these buttons and these, but it's actually just down there. Airbag is quite pretty, nice and small. Overall, quite a pretty steering wheel. There's your automatic wipers and automatic headlights. And then the dials, there's two types of dials with this car. You can have these analog ones with the digital display in the middle, or it can be all digital and you can control it with these buttons here. So I move this button, see, and I've got different things coming up. So that's Android Auto, the trip computer, settings, and this is for like the driver aids, like the lane keep assist. Well, I don't know what LTA stands for, I can't remember, but it is basically lane keep assist and the messages and then back to eco currently 53.8 miles per gallon but more on that one later i think you might be surprised by this car so hard plastics here that's soft that's hard a tray here although uh nothing's going to stay there there's no matting there put some coins there it's just going to fall off when you go around a bend there's a mat here for your phone and this doesn't move around when i'm driving i can put my phone here plug it in to Android Auto there, but there's only one USB. There is a 12 volt socket down there though, which will be handy. And another mat here, although this isn't very rubbery. This one is up here, that's really rubbery, but this one feels less so. They look the same, but they don't feel the same. If you got the top spec model, you would actually have a longer opening here to charge your phone and you get dual zone climate control instead of single zone like this one. Here's the stop start button. And then we have the screen. This tells you what's going on. There's your battery, engine, electric motor, and it tells you what's happening as you're driving. It's not a very responsive screen and it is slow. So if I press home, I pressed it and then it moves. If I press the button here and then it moves. So there's a bit of a delay there. Some more vents here. You can't control the intensity again, but you can control direction and you can turn them off all the way to the left on that one and all the way to the left on that one turns them off and then you can move them to where you want them to be. A hazard warning light switch there. Gear stick, or should I say drive selector. It's an automatic, not a manual. Very nice, that feels nice to the touch. You have B mode on this car, which means if you put it in B instead of D, you have like a, it's not quite a one pedal mode because it doesn't do all the braking, but it does a lot of braking. You can just come off the gas and the car will slow down quite quickly, so you don't need to use the brake very often. Or D for normal drive, and then N for neutral, R for reverse, and P of course for park. And then we've got the drive modes. At the moment, we're in Eco. It says Eco just there, if you can see. Now, if I press this button, and you look there again where it says Eco, it will go off, which means it means normal, there's nothing there at all. Press it again, you get power, and then you get eco. And I've been keeping it in eco because it's an eco car, and I kind of think, well, makes sense for it to be an eco. That's to turn off your stability control, and this is EV mode. The car can be in EV mode for low speeds for a short period of time if you want to be quiet. This is the hold button, you press that. When you come off the brake after stopping, the car won't move. No matter what the hill is, it will keep you there. And that's the electronic parking brake. 
couple of cup holders there. I'll just uh, go back to the door bin to get my half litre bottle and easily fits a half litre bottle. Two of those probably fit a small thermos flask as well. I'd like it to be a bit tighter. That does move around a little bit. Armrest here. There is some padding there. Not a lot though, although it is very well placed for me to have my arm there and hold the steering wheel, so it's comfortable. There is a little bit of storage in here, enough for a phone, it's very shallow, but again, things are gonna move around in there because there's no rubber matting, so I wouldn't like to put coins or anything in there. Close that, and you can actually lift it up to get it out of the way if you wish, but I'm actually quite enjoying that, so I'm gonna leave that down. Uh, moving up here, this is not automatic dimming. It is, as you can see here, manual dimming on this one. But if you get the top spec, you do get automatic dimming. Some lights up here. Um, that's to turn it on and off for when the door is open or closed. And then we've got the sun visors with outer light. There's a mirror on this side, no light though. And on this side, yes, another mirror, but no light. The roof lining isn't the nicest. It's, uh, I haven't seen one like this for a while. It's quite cheap. I wouldn't like to get this dirty because I think if I was to have to clean it, I'd damage it. And there's already, already some marks here where it looks like someone has scuffed it. Plenty of airbags about the place though. Airbags on the A pillars. Also an airbag in between the driver and the passenger. So in an accident, there's a separation between, well, you don't, bang into each other, which I think would be quite helpful actually. You don't want to hit your heads against each other if you roll the car. So I think that's a nice little touch. Ah, I forgot about the glove box. So, open that. Oh, that's nice, it's damped. It doesn't shoot down. It's not very big though. You can fit the lock and wheel nut box and the owner's manual, but not much else. It's Spartan in the rear. There's no air vents. We do have electric windows though, but also a blanking cap where the keep fit windows were. All the plastics are hard back here, but there is a space there for a half litre bottle. Let's see these windows, see what they're like. Oh, one touch and wow, pretty much all the way down. And one touch to go up. Visibility back here is excellent. If you suffer from car sickness, you can really see what's going on which should make you feel more comfortable because there's a nice big space here. Kids are going to like sitting back here. There's nowhere to put anything in the back of the seats, so no pouch, and there's no lights at the top. So it is basic. We have seats, seat belts, and obviously a floor to put your feet. I like the air conditioning in this car because when you're stationary with the engine off, it uses the battery to power the aircon, so you don't need the engine. When the battery gets too low, the engine will kick in to charge it up. But I've been sitting here for a little while now, and well, it hasn't had to kick in very much to charge the battery. And when it does, it only kicks in for like 15, 20 seconds, but then the engine stays off for minutes. So it's very efficient. Let's see how this drives. I'm gonna start off with maneuvering. So foot on the brake, press the power button, it's on, ready to go. Pull this into D, that's it. Look around, make sure it's safe, and let's try and turn it around. Steering is very light, and it creeps with the brake pedal, so you don't have to use the gas, you can just use the brake to control it at low speeds. And the turning circle is impressive. That has gone round there better than I'm used to. I'm used to cars with around about an 11 meter turning circle. I would say this is under 10, I'm not sure what it is, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's nine, so it makes maneuvering very easy. There are no parking sensors on this. There's only parking sensors on the top model, which is a shame, but you do get a reversing camera, which is odd because you normally get parking sensors before the camera. But I think it might have something to do with America, if they sell this car in America. I don't actually know, but I believe parking cameras are actually compulsory over there now. I might be wrong, let me know in the comments. So back into drive, so easy to turn so easy to maneuver. Good visibility all around as well. Nice sized wing mirrors and the seals aren't so high that you can't see around you. You can really see down there. I'm now going to do some country roads, then I'll go on to some urban roads and then motorways. I'm in a 40 at the moment. I'm in an eco mode, coming up to a national speed limit soon. The car actually feels planted. It's stable. Here's the 60 limit, just slow down because he's sticking his nose out a bit there. And put my foot down, let's go. 
Yeah, acceleration isn't bad. It doesn't feel, well, should I say it feels faster than it is? It feels like, yay, we're going. Uh, but then you look at the speedo and it's not actually risen that much. And the CVT gearbox does give a constant noise, like a vroom, but it's, it's not loud, it's not intrusive, it's okay. For the car, it's fine. This is an eco car and it's actually, it's all right on these roads. The steering is numb. I can't feel how much grip I have, but it's stable. There's not too much roll and it does appear to be a fair amount of grip there considering it's only got skinny tires. I believe they're 185 wide when I checked and I'm already doing nearly 60. It's very quiet. When you're cruising, it's incredibly quiet. And at full acceleration, it's also quiet, but with just that slight of the engine as it pushes you along. You don't get the normal sound of because it's got a CVT gearbox, so it's a continuous velocity. Or actually, I always get this wrong. CVT stands for continuously variable transmission. But for some reason, I always think of it as constant velocity transmission because it sounds like a constant velocity because the engine is at a constant velocity. It keeps the revs at a set place. This is the straight I normally launch the car. It's slightly uphill, but it is local. So I'm stopped, there's no one behind and foot to the floor. Initial response seems positive. 40 miles an hour happened quite quickly. Now it seems to be taking a while and there we go, 60 miles per hour. Apparently it's supposed to be done in 9.7 seconds, but it does feel a bit quicker than that, especially as there's no gear changes. It is a very constant pull that gradually gets less and less the faster you get. By the time you're over 50, it does feel like it's pulling quite gently. After some mildly enthusiastic driving on some country roads with a 60 mile per hour limit, I've averaged 59.6 miles per gallon. That truly is impressive. In a car of this size and this performance, powered by petrol only, I usually get less than 40 miles per gallon on those roads driving in a similar manner. So 59.6 is not to be sniffed at. This is done well and you don't have to plug this hybrid in. You just put petrol in. Only a small tank though, 36 litres, but it doesn't need a big tank. I'm now gonna drive to a motorway. It's actually a dual carriageway. It's a trip I do often. It is mostly uphill, but only a very mild gradient. And even the most economical cars I drive struggle to get 40 miles per gallon on this trip. So we'll see how this one does. I've reset the trip computer and I've just driven up the road and it's already showing 85.5 miles per gallon. It's not using any engine, it's just using the battery. It does impress me how often it uses the battery and not the engine. So I'm moving now, still only battery. The radar cruise control works quite well. It's not always perfect, but most of the time it does slow me down and speed me up smoothly. And in traffic, it will actually bring me to a complete stop and when I'm stationary, if I wanna get going again when the traffic starts to move, I do have to just press the gas pedal to get it moving. So what's it, 62.4 now, engine is running to charge up the battery. I'm impressed with the ride quality. It's very stable and it recovers quickly. It's not the softest of rides, but it is very comfortable. If I hit a bump, there's a bump and then that's it. There's no wobbling after, afterwards, and it does round it off nicely. It doesn't feel like a car of this size. It feels like more like a Golf, a bit bigger. Cars that are a bit bigger usually have a slightly better ride. Now I'm in some proper traffic. This is where hybrid economy is really going to show its stars. 90.7 miles per gallon. It's nice moving away in electric because it's silent, it's also responsive. It's very smooth at low speeds. Usually the gas pedal at low speeds can be a bit jerky when you're in first gear, but that's not the case in this car. It doesn't really have first gear, it's that CVT gearbox. So yeah, 
absolutely no perceived gear changes there at all. It's just a constant presence of power that's easy to control and smooth. Up a hill now, off the gas, slowing down. Doesn't roll back. Or I haven't had it roll back yet. If I stop, I just come off the brake and then it pulls me forwards. 98.5 miles per gallon. I don't think it's going to average that. That's, that's a good start. We will see. Engine's running now. Charging up the battery. That's when the economy will drop, when the engine's running. Here you go, 72.5. So it does depend when you look at the trip computer to uh, what the number's going to be. It does vary drastically. I can look at it one moment, it's like 100. Look at it another moment, there you go, it's 72. Either way, still. That's an impressive number. Radar cruise control ready and on, set to 30. And now I can just relax and steer. Oh, I turn off the lane keep assist. It's not good. Hold down the button on the top right hand corner of the steering wheel here to turn it off. Um, I passed a parked car once, went to go back to my side of the road and it pushed me back to the wrong side of the road because I was crossing the line in the middle. These lane keep assist things, in my experience, just don't really work. I find, if anything, they just make me feel uncomfortable. Oh, radar cruise control is slowing me down now. How on earth does it know it needs to slow me down? Surely. Oh no, now it's speeding me up again. So, don't know what was happening there. It slowed me down, but there was no car in front slowing down. I thought, maybe it knows the roundabout's coming, because it was actually slowing down really well for this roundabout. I thought, oh, I'll see what happens. But then it started accelerating again. So there, these driving assistant things, they're not perfect. You still need a driver, but they do take some of the stress out of, out of having to modulate the gas and keep it at the speed limit or even keeping a good distance from the car in front it can do that for you as well but you still need to be aware you still need to be ready to take control but it does make long journeys easier it's a little bit less traffic here today than usual so we'll expect a better fuel economy figure than i'm used to getting because there's usually queues of cars on this hill yeah by four o'clock it's quarter past four and by now it's usually queued right the way back to that roundabout but i've managed to get all the way here without one queue but it is showing 85 miles per gallon so that is better than usual there's something i liked about this car the moment i sat in it it does happen sometimes it happened when i got in my say it lounge which i've owned for eight and a half years now just instantly i went oh and that was the seat it's a really comfortable seat it's soft supportive i've been sitting in this seat most of the day and i don't feel like i need to get out the pedals are nice they're a good distance from each other it's a nice driving position with a nice place steering wheel and somewhere to put your arms a little bit more padding would be nice though using the radar cruise control at the moment it's keeping me a nice distance from this blue ford fiesta in front I'll show you if the car in front stops. I'll show you how it stops the car, but I can feel it slowing me down now. It's set to a maximum of 30, and I've got it on its maximum distance setting, and it's actually keeping a nice distance between me and that blue Fiesta on its max setting. I don't feel too close. Uh, I don't feel too far. This is about where I would be driving. There's not a lot of road noise in here. I feel like I could probably whisper, and you can hear what I'm saying. Can you hear that? Well, I don't know, don't know if it comes across on microphone. But you don't hear the engine, you don't hear the electric motor really. Not much road noise, not much wind noise, very quiet. And the power's there when you want to pull away quickly at a roundabout. It does get up to 20 miles an hour, impressively fast. You think it's going to be a much faster car, but then after that it takes a little while. Just turn the cruise control on from a near stop. I'm off the gas and it's accelerating me up to 30 and keeping a safe distance. So you can actually activate the cruise control when you're at a near standstill. You can resume the previous speed and it'll just take you there. 
Now it's a red light, is it going to slow me down here? Yep, slowing down, feels smooth, feels comfortable. I'm going to cover the brake just in case. And what about the stop? Not a bad stop. I could stop better. I would have more of a chauffeur finish than the car has. But if I was a passenger and the driver stopped like that, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable or unhappy. When the lights go green, we'll see what happens. Well, to be fair, I know what happens. The car won't move away. When the, when the car in front starts moving, I will have to press the gas gently and then it will start again. It won't start on its own. So here we go, the car in front's moving. Press the gas, come off the gas pedal and there we go. It gets going up to 30 miles per hour. Hear a little bit of engine now. Yep, the engine is running. You can hear it when it's running. It is subtle, but it is there. I'm gonna brake now because what this radar guided cruise control doesn't know is this silver car needs to pull in front of me now. So I'm gonna manually control the speed, make sure the car behind's going behind me. And then, whoops, wrong one. Re-engage it, there you go. Right, that's the correct button. I moved the thing on the screen instead of my cruise control there. Get a bit confused switching cars, which side the buttons are on, but now it's just controlling me, keep myself, keep me a safe distance from the car in front. That is an impressive turning circle. In my car, I would not have made that round. I would have had to reverse. I've just finished my urban trip, predominantly uphill. I usually get around 40 to the gallon in an economical car. I do this trip a lot, 81.1 miles per gallon. I have to seriously reconsider what I'm driving. That is a big difference. That's a big saving. That's like half the fuel I'm used to using. I'm at the dual carriageway. I'm going to reset the trip computer. There we are. I'm going to have to use a different dual carriageway to usual because the one I would usually use is actually a 40 mile per hour limit now and I need to go 70 to do this test. So I'm going to go towards Harwich, which is mostly 70, go around the roundabout and come back again and we'll see what the fuel economy is like. I'll also try and test out this lane guidance. I think this car should be able to keep itself in its lane. So steering assist active. Okay, accelerating onto the fast road now. 60 miles per hour, going to merge behind the silver Mercedes. Very quiet at speed, got a bit of wind noise, bit of tyre noise. Engine is running but I can't hear it. I could only hear it when I accelerated quickly. I'm not sure how this lane thing works. If I let go of the wheel, does it steer me? Is it keeping me in my lane? going towards the left line and it's, it is steering me and that's going towards the right line and that's telling me to hold the wheel. So I don't think it actually keeps you in your lane like my friend's Tesla Model 3 does. I think if you go near a line it will just move you to one side and start beeping at you. There's some different settings on here. Steering assist active, lane centering active and then just steering assist. So steering assist assist and lane centering. So I've pressed lane centering. Is that going to keep me in the middle? I put on the radar cruise control as well for the speed I'm doing. I asked for 70. There we go and it'll follow the car in front. I'm ready to take the wheels. Oh, oh it's going around this bend. Oh. So I just had to press that button again and it's actually doing something now. It's keeping me in the middle of this lane. Well, it's doing it well. It's not bouncing from line to line. It's telling me to hold the wheel. And now it's saying steering assist unavailable. Oh no, it is working. It is, I can feel it's doing something. It wants you to hold the wheel. You just hold it gently. And it's, it's doing a good job. I'm very surprised. This is only the second car I've been in that's actually done a good job of keeping me in the middle of a 
my lane on a motorway there's a car merging there so I'm going to use the brake just to slow down and let them out again this is where the driver needs to be aware the um, driving assistants will only react at the last moment to things like that but the driver can see it happening and can instead of reacting just act before it's a react see if I can get into the faster lane and actually get 70 miles an hour space here now cruise control back on set to 70 with distance control and lane control it's saying on here something about the lanes these little lines here it's still steering for me I'm just holding the wheel gently it's doing 70 keeping a safe distance from the car in front the car's in the slow lane of sped up now so although I've moved over there I'm not overtaking them so I'm going to go back change lane myself there and I could feel the radar pick up the silver car in front and slow me down a little bit even though the lane assist thing that keeps me in the middle of the lane is on um, it allowed me to change lane and then it picked up this lane I could feel it and started keeping me in this lane and it's it's working well it's certainly more central than that silver car in front for example you can see they're nearly on the white line and uh, yeah I'm back to doing 60 again that was quite annoying sped up to 70 and uh, yeah they sped up so am I actually going to get the 70 well I've got another opportunity now another space there so I accelerate up the 70 there we go change lane myself ah there we go 70 now the lane assist is working speed is working very relaxing it is actually helpful this steering thing it's not as helpful as the cruise control cruise control for me is the biggest step in uh, taking away driver fatigue on long journeys from what I can tell this steering assist is helping a little bit but because I'm having to hold the wheel anyway there's not much there doesn't feel to be much difference in terms of what I'm doing I can feel it moving the wheel instead of me moving the wheel so there is some guidance there but I'd have to I have to use it over a really long journey to really know how it affects me on a long journey but I'm really liking this uh, radar cruise control it's one of the better ones I've used I'm starting to feel the lack of padding now in these armrests I do have quite bony elbows and this elbow in particular because there really is no padding on that one that's starting to ache if I put my arm differently on it it's all right but then I can't really use the steering wheel that is a shame tiny little bit of padding there would make this car so much more comfortable on a long journey maybe one day maybe that'll be next year's model I'm not sure if I'd actually use this lane keep assist thing I was telling me to hold the wheel I thought I was well it wants me to hold the wheel better I'm not sure if I would use it if I had this car long term because although it is doing a good job I prefer to do a better job I can keep the steering more central more consistently than it can you can feel when I'm holding the wheel it's just doing like a little bit of a turn a little bit of a turn this way a little bit of a turn and I'm just thinking I could just hold this steady and keep it on this slight curve but I don't know I won't know whether I would or not until I actually had such a system in one of my own cars you don't actually have to hold the steering wheel that gently to let it do its job. I've taken my arms off the armrests, I'm holding it, putting all the weight of my arms on the steering wheel at the moment actually, and it's still moving the steering, I can feel it moving the steering wheel. It feels a bit better this way actually. I feel like it's controlling the car, but I'm more ready if I need to be. I was worried that if I was to move the steering wheel or rest on the steering wheel a bit hard that will cut the system out but it doesn't appear to in fact I can steer and you see it still works it then just takes over from where I left off so there we are a decent amount of time at 70 and I've averaged 68.8 miles per gallon so I've heard hybrids don't get their fuel economy on these faster roads because you don't use the battery but this one does this one it uses the engine a lot more when you're at speed but it still uses that battery and it still manages to get 
well, it's better than diesel economy, really. And now I'm slowing down 70 miles per gallon. Wow. I'm on an urban road again, and I've left the steering assist on, and it's not working. It can't work. The road markings here aren't good enough, and it's not showing me two white lines here to say it can do the steering. It's only getting one line every so often. Oh, it's got it now. When you get the blue lines, it's actually working. So it's actually doing it now because the road surface is better and the markings are better. Although I felt like I had to steer there because it felt like it was going to go over the white line on the right. Now it's slowing down for the car in front and beeping to tell me that it can't do lane assist. So I'm actually going to turn that off now because in urban driving, hold the button down for three seconds there, it's off now. In urban driving, I hate it. I, it it's, it's too many markings on the road. It just gets confused and moves, moves me about all over the place where I don't want to go. Most people don't buy new cars with cash. Typically, they buy them on finance. So when I quote 21,000 to 24,500 for this new car, it doesn't really mean much. So I've asked Graham to give me a quote for how much it would cost to buy this car on finance. I'll put it on screen now. It should be the deposit, um, how much per month for how many months, interest rate, final payment, and any other fees. If you think this video helps you learn about the Mazda 2 Hybrid, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.